Today, I'm going to talk about the Intel Math Kernel Library from Deep Learning, so our MKLDNN for short. So I'm going to talk about different levels. So most of the time, people writing deep learning applications won't need to bother about MKLDNN at all, so it should be buried under some framework. So here, most of the users will be using something in the big black gray box here, so a framework. Whether it be, uh, whether it be um, an open source framework like TensorFlow, PyTorch, or something similar, but it can also be like an Intel product. So usually those are not frameworks, but they will be here to help you deploy applications. So for example, you have a trained model, you want to deploy it on edge devices, for example, you will do something like OpenVINO. <laughs> and the third category here are in-house applications. So we have a lot of people, either from companies or academics, that have a tailored solution for their applications. So if they, if they do like imaging or very specific applications, TensorFlow might not fit their needs, so they have their own framework, a dedicated framework, and sometimes we come and help them to optimize them on Intel hardware. So the way it works is for open source framework, we try to integrate every optimizations we can inside the framework and upstream that to the master branch. So this way, if you're a user of TensorFlow, for example, you shouldn't bother about MKL and MKLDNN. Just download TensorFlow, you link it, that is linked with MKL, and it should work perfectly fine. So if we are not allowed to push these kind of changes, sometimes we have to create our own branch, so there are Intel uh, optimized branches. So for example, that's the case for CAFE, you have Intel CAFE. And if, even though you won't have like specific optimizations for Intel, on CAFE, you may still be able to take the optimized Intel CAFE, and this one is kept in sync with the official CAFE, so usually there is no problem going from one to another. <laughs> and finally, for the in-house application, most of the time we just work with the customer or work with the people involved in this project, and we help them get uh, performance there. So as I said, Intel MKL and MKL DNN are two separate libraries, so people think of them as one is a wrapper around the other, that's not true. So they implement very different kind of functionalities. So MKL is more uh, tailored for HPC, so you'll have a lot of linear algebra, solvers, FFTs, and this kind of primitives, so it's not necessarily DNN related. But in MKL DNN, you will have a very specific primitives. So you'll have normalization layers, you will have convolutions, optimized convolutions, you'll have these kind of things that are really important to optimize a uh, deep neural network. <laughs> so MKLDN is open source, so you can download it and build it whenever, however you want. You can ask questions on GitHub, so it's freely available. You can contribute code, we welcome pull requests. So if at some point you want to add a functionality, you can just do it and make a pull request and we'll be glad to accept it. Uh, on the other hand, MKL is closed source, so it's proprietary. You cannot see the source, but you can still get it freely, so either through the Intel Registration Center, or you can even get it through package managers, so with a Aptitude, YUM, and Conta, for example. <laughs> so all of, all of this to just say one thing, you shouldn't care about MKL and MKLDN. <laughs> if you are a deep learning application engineer, just go for the, go for the framework, and it should be enabled for Intel architecture. So here is an example of speedus you will get. So these slides are from August. So on these two slides, so on the one on the left, it's uh, measured by Intel people. On the one on the right, it's measured by customers. So it's measured by uh, Google and Amazon. <laughs> so here the key point is that they took exactly the same sources, built them without linking to MKL and MKLDNN, and built them with linking to MKL and MKLDNN. And for training, they were getting about 10 plus X speed up and for inference, 3 plus X speed up. So it's kind of a marketing slide, but here I just want to highlight that there is a lot of performance left on the table if you are not linking to MKL and MKLDNN. So how do you get uh, those builds linking to MKL and MKLDNN? So I think on Theta, you already have uh, TensorFlow that is built correctly and with the right setup, but here I just want to stress again the importance of it. So for every Python-based framework, what you want to do is not use the default Python distribution, but use the Intel Python distribution. The main idea behind that is uh, most of the NumPy operations will be backed by Intel, by, by Intel MKL. <laughs> so that way you will have like, so first you will have 
much you have a, a good speed ups for gems, for example, in this kind of primitives. But more importantly, you also have all the verbose and all the debugging facilities that come with MKL. So, and again, you can get it through package, through package managers like Conda, IAM, or Aptitude. Then once you have that Intel Python distribution, you can grab a TensorFlow wheel. So there are two ways to get one that has MKL and MKLDNN in it. Either you download the one that is on the GitHub page from TensorFlow, so there are pre-built packages. So you will get speed ups. The problem is that those are generic binaries. So they will be built for SSE 4.2 and plus. So there won't be they won't be built specifically for, for one hardware. So the best way to go would be to build yourself TensorFlow from the master branch. That way you can specify exactly that first you want it built for Knight's Landing, which is what you have on Theta. <laughs> and also you can build it such that uh, MKLDN will integrate flawlessly with VTune. So the idea here is that MKLDN uh, JITs code, so at runtime we generate code and those code are not profi these pieces of code are not profiled by VTune uh, by default. So you have to have a special build. So you have to put a special flag for these GDIT kernels to be profiled by VTune. <laughs> so I highly recommend you to look at the CPU optimization guidelines that are in, on the TensorFlow web page. So there is a list of a list of CPU optimization parameters that you should set to have the best performance on Intel platforms. So, um, and also, the, another reason I recommend building from master, so building TensorFlow from the master branch, is that uh, there is a lot of active work on MKLDN integration in TensorFlow. So mostly weekly, you can get performance boost if you rebuild, if you rebuild TensorFlow. <coughs> so yes, we've seen sometimes people gain, getting like a 10x just from one week to the next, just because one primitive was not optimized and now it is optimized. Okay, so TensorFlow is good and it's widely, widely used, but in real life, it's not the most performant. <laughs> it's not the most performant framework. If you want something that goes as fast as possible, you should go for the CAFE branch, the Intel, uh, the Intel distribution for CAFE, sorry. <laughs> so it's a fork of the Berkeley CAFE that is maintained by Intel. As I said earlier, it's maintained in sync with the official one, so moving from one to another usually is quite simple. And so far, it's the best performing uh, framework on CPUs. So it is fast, it, ha it, 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 it integrates all the functionalities of MKLDNN, and it also supports low precision inference. So here, we'll come back to that later, but mainly the idea is that you train with float32, and then you can do inference with int8 formats. <laughs> so now an overview, so we talked enough about the frameworks, now I'll give an overview of MKLDNN. So, the philosophy of MKLDNN is to not implement all the functionality of a framework. So a framework is here to provide functionalities. MKL and MKLDNN are here to provide performance. So what we do is that we implement only a selected set of primitives, and those primitives will be key for performance. And just optimizing this, headful, this handful of primitives will enable to have actually very good speedups on most of the topologies. So we support training and inference in Float32, we also support inference in int8, which is the quantized version. We support CNNs, so 1D, 2D, and 3D, and also recurrent neural network. So for those, we have like plain RNNs, LSTM, GU, and we have a second variant of GU cells too. And all of these are optimized for all Intel platforms. So from the Atoms, Core, Xeon, Xeon 5, so almost any platform is enabled with that. <laughs> so it's open source but it's also portable, so you can compile it with almost any compiler. So this is the list for which we track the, that it builds properly and we have proper performance. So we support ICC, so Intel compiler, Clang, GCC, and Microsoft Visual Studio compiler. We support Linux, Windows, and Mac, and also we have two threading layers, OpenMP and TBB. So OpenMP will be slightly faster most of the time. TBB might be better if you oversubscribe the machine, but I don't recommend oversubscribing the machine. But those are the two threading layers we have. And here is a non-exhaustive list of frameworks that use MKLDNN. So if your favorite framework is in that list, you shouldn't bother. Just download it, and it should work fine. OK. So now I'll go a little bit deeper into the design of MKLDNN. So first, I will highlight a number of key performance considerations on the CPU. 
So uh, those will be three. I will just explain what is the, how is it? I will give a high level description of those considerations, and then I will go deeper into how we, how we take those into account in our APIs. So first of all, so I think I had the question about memory layouts, uh, maybe the first day I arrived. The question was, uh, is NH, NHWC better than NCHW? And the answer is that both are bad, actually. <laughs> so uh, they are either bad for vectorization or they are bad for cache thrashing. So we, mo we almost never compute directly on those formats. What we do is that we, we use what we call blocked formats. So most of the time we block on the channel dimension. So yes, sorry, I didn't mention that. So here NHWC stands for the mini batch, N is the mini batch dimension, H is the height, W is the width, and C is the number of channels in the tensor. <laughs> so here what we will do is that we will block on the channels, and most of the time the blocking size will be the SIMD width of the architecture. So for example, if you're on nice landing, you will block uh, on the channels by 16, which is the width of the SIMD, of the SIMD register. So because now you have those blocks layout and plain layout and you have to mix and match them and reorder them, the philosophy behind the library is that you don't have to choose. You create a convolution, so you create like a computation intensive primitive, you ask it what is its preferred format, and then you propagate that format to other primitives that are non-computationally intensive. So optimized framework, sorry, optimized framework track memory layouts and performs reorder as needed, so you don't have to take care of that logic. But it might happen that that logic is broken in the framework and profiling might help you find that, those issues. So I will come back to that later. So the second consideration is that a CPU doesn't have much bandwidth to the DRAM. So because of that, a lot of time can be spent in uh, memory bound operations. So for example, if you take ResNet 50 during the training phase, if you optimize a lot the convolution, so you, you reduce as much as possible the computation, the computation intensive part, you still have 40% of the computation that is spent just in memory bound operations. So the solution here would be to fuse these bandwidth limited operations. So if you fuse them, instead of doing multiple passes over memory, you will just do one pass and multiple operation for one pass. So we support that currently uh, for the most common fusions. So you, a lot of topologies have a repeating pattern. So for example, if you take ResNet 50, you have a, like a fundamental block that repeats, and we, we generally support those common, those common blocks. So we, do, we can do convolution plus ReLU plus SUM or batch num plus ReLU and these kind of things. So it's done for inference. It's a work in progress for training. We don't support that for training yet. So again, this is the framework that is expected to do that. So if you're, uh, if you're a deep learning application developer, you shouldn't care about it. If you're a framework developer, you should care about it. <laughs> so the framework are expected to detect the fusion opportunities and to see if it matches the supported fusion from MKLDNN and apply them. And actually that can be an issue. So that's something that we're working on currently. So because the framework has to know what is supported by MKLDNN, currently it's kind of tough for the framework to, to, to know that logic. So we're trying to modify our APIs to make it more, let's, let's say, scalable. <laughs> the third consideration is that we have lower precision available. So for inference, as I mentioned earlier, you can, you can quantize your model. So you can train FP30 in float32, quantize it to int8, and do inference. The good thing about it is that it has been shown, it has been shown that for many cases, you have no loss of accuracy during inference phase when you do that. However, you get a big uh, performance improvement. So to preserve accuracy, though, you still have to keep some operations. So typically, it's the batch norm. You have to keep it in float32 and not quantize it to int8. But that doesn't change, that doesn't change the performance much. OK, so maybe as you noticed so far, many times I mentioned it's up to the framework to do something. And because it's up to the framework to do some things, all the, uh, how I say that, all the potential of MKLDNN is not necessarily revealed in the framework you, you use. So MKLDNN is designed for best performance. But if you don't integrate all the functionality of it, you won't get that best performance. So if you look at that, uh, let's say, simplified picture, 
So on top is the original code. If you do a naive integration, what you would do is that every time you create a convolution, you ask for what format it, ex it expects, you reorder to that format, you run the convolution, and then you reorder back to the original format. <coughs> if you do that, you will still get uh, speed ups though. So I, if I remember when the TensorFlow people started to integrate KDN, when they did that, they got 3x speed ups on like common topologies. <coughs> So you will get a speed up, but you will not get the best speed up possible. Because you will set, now you'll have like a, an overhead of reordering the data. So you, every time you have a convolution, we'll start reordering, convolution, reorder, and so on. So the best thing to do would be to propagate the layout. So here, if you propagate the layout, you will reorder once at the beginning, run the convolution, and then run all the operations with the same data layout. And then at the end, you will, you will convert back to the original format. So if you do that, you will get much better performance but it's still not the best performance achievable, achievable. To get the best performance achievable, now you'll have to fuse layers. So here, this is a common block, convolution plus ReLU plus batch norm. <laughs> so if you do that, for example, on inference, so you can integrate the batch norm statistic inside the weights, inside the bias, and then in the convolution, you can fuse ReLU, and now you have just one primitive. And so in the hands-on session, you will, you will be able to play and time the things. But basically, doing convolution plus ReLU is the same time as doing convolution. So you get ReLU and batch norm for free here. But again, I think the key point here is, depending on how tight is the integration of MKL, you will get a different level of performance. And because all frameworks do not integrate at the same level, you might have the exact same topology with two frameworks that have MKL DNA enabled, but that will have different performance, just because of that integration levels that are different. Okay, so now that I mentioned the, let's say the, the key considerations for performance, uh, I, I would like to, to show what is the MKLDN library philosophy. So what are the concepts that we, that we have and how we leverage the, those considerations with our APIs. So first, the key concepts. So it's like in frameworks. So in frameworks, when you have a, a topology, so first you describe the computation and then you run the computation. So in MKLDNN, we have that that is shown through the descriptors and then handles on primitives and memories. So the descriptor will give you, okay, what is the shape of my data and what are the properties of my data and my computation primitives. Then you have primitives, which are just a handle to a particular compute operation. So you have three operations for those. You can create them, execute them, or destroy them. The reason for those three steps is that if you create, you can create once and execute many times that way you kind of, <coughs> sorry, that way you amortize the creation cost. Note that in MKLDNN, the creation cost is not small because when you create a primitive, we actually generate the code that will compute the primitive. We also allocate memory for temporary buffers. So, and this, this can be some overhead. So if you are like, uh, if you are a framework developer, please don't do create, execute, destroy. Every time you create, try to, try to cache those created primitives and reuse them as much as possible. <laughs> then you have memories, which are, which are just handled to data. You have streams that are handled to an execution context. So here, what I call an execution context is that you can schedule many primitives for execution and then run that stream. <laughs> and finally, you have uh, the engine. So the engine is a handle to an execution device. The point here is that MKLDNN should be flexible enough such, such that you can accommodate it for any kind of device. So I know there was a fork of MKLDNN that, that supports FPGAs, for example. We have support for GPU that is coming. So, and that's the way we, we handle that. So every time you create things, you specify which engine you want to run on, and you run on that thing. So it's very similar to how framework works. So now to the first uh, key performance consideration. So layout propagation. So as I mentioned, NHWC and NTHW are not the proper format to do computation on. So what you want to do is when you create the primitive, you, you have to pass it memory descriptor. So you have to, to describe what is the shape and properties of its inputs and outputs. So you can put the shapes as you need because that how, that's how you describe the computation. However, for the layouts, any primitive that can support an input of with layout any, please create it with those lay create those descriptors with the layout any. What the layout any do does is it specifies to the primitive creation that you don't care about the layout of that input. The primitive is free to choose. So, you <coughs> so convolution support that and RNN support that. 
if you if that primitive does not support inputs or outputs with any data format, then just specify the one that you have from the previous layer of, of that is imposed by the next layer. So then you create a primitive descriptor and primitive using those memory descriptors. And now that you have a primitive, you can query it for which layout it expects. So and that's why you have to create reorders. So you have your primitive, you have your primitive. It expects some data layout, but data layout doesn't match the data layout of your input. So then you have to create a temporary buffer, reorder to that temporary buffer, and then pass the temporary buffer to your primitive. So it's kind of cumbersome, but that's the most flexible way we have between having the user that has full control over the layouts and having the primitive that you can query and then pass it stuff as it expects. And then the fourth step is you create, so you enqueue the primitive and the reorders in the right order and you queue them for execution. So the second consideration was to um, fuse layers. So here we have a simple mechanism in MKLDN called the primitive attributes. And it's, it, it's, it's rather simple actually. So you just create what we call a post-op structure. Then you have an append function where you can append primitives. So you can say, sorry, you can say append relu, append sum, append batch norm. <laughs> and then you, you will attach the post-op structure to your primitive descriptor. And for the quantized models, so it's, it's very similar. So you create an attribute. You will say, what are the scaling factors? So the scaling factor is the value by which you will multiply your float before rounding it to an integer of 8 bit. And so you, you will also specify your rounding mode because you have rounding happening. And then you pass that attribute to the primitive, and you are done. OK, so I know that that last part was pretty low level, and most of the viewers. <laughs> won't have to handle that. So the key takeaways here is if you're, so if you're an application developer, so if you're writing deep learning application, a deep learning application, you should not care about MKN and MKDN. Just pick your favorite framework or the Intel fork of that favorite framework and use it and you will get, you should get the best performance possible. If you're a framework developer, on the other hand, here you can get better performance on Intel processors using that MKLDN. <laughs> So also be aware as a user that there are different levels of integration. So the same topology on two different frameworks that use MKLDNN might not have the same performance because they don't necessarily integrate MKLDNN in the same way. And finally, here something I want to highlight is that you can profile to identify performance gaps. So there are several causes to performance gaps usually in application. It's either an integration that is not complete so if there are holes in the integration of MKLDNN on the framework, you might not get the whole benefit of MKLDNN. There is also some performance sensitive function that we don't have in MKLDNN. So if you have such cases, for example, if you are running your topology, some primitive is taking 50% of the time, and you think it's a very important primitive that can benefit many topologies, always feel free to come on the GitHub page and ask us, OK, here I have that primitive. It's very slow. Can you do something about it? And we'll consider that. So either we'll tell you how to optimize it yourself, to implement it yourself, or we'll just add it to MKLDNN. And finally, it can be just an MK, a performance in MKLDNN. So you can have the framework that does the right stuff. It's calling MKLDNN, but just MKLDNN has bad performance on that instance. So again, feel free to come on the GitHub page and tell us, OK, I, I have very bad performance for that instance. Can you do something about it? And we'll very likely do something about it. <laughs> so that was it. If there is any question. That's very true. So I, I would say it depends. So MKLDN and MKLDN support AMD platform. MKLDN is open source, so nothing prevents people to add optim specific optimization to AMD. We don't have specific optimizations, but we don't dispatch based on the um, based on the architecture, based on the on the um, how's it called? on the vendor name. So if if the CPU supports AVX2, we'll dispatch the AVX2 code, and that's it. The only thing that will change is for the cache sizes. So we query them through CPU ID. So we'll just query the size of the cache. And so you should get decent performance on AMD. And actually, we have customers. So um, we have some uh, cloud service providers that access about that. So we support AMD, and the performance is not that bad on AMD. The only thing is that we don't optimize specifically for AMD in mind when you optimize. But you, you should get better. You should get enough performance. Or at least I, I'm pretty sure you should get better performance than whatever is in the framework originally. Yes, so I can. So 
here is the list. This is a short list, but here is the list. Typically, we have convolutions that are very well optimized. So for most of them, we should get 80 plus percent efficiency. <coughs> so most of the instances will be jitted. So if you have AVX, for I think it's not working properly. Okay, that's better. So uh, for, for almost everything, we have jitted code. So if you have AVX 512 on KNL or Skylake server, you will have jitted code. You, there, is specific path, path, there are specific paths for one by one, non one by one, for forward, backward, and backward by, backward by waste and backward by data. But most of the time it's jitted. For all the others, so for reorders, for example, it's jitted too. For um, uh, element wise, putting, actually it's almost jitted for everything. There are very few primitives that have like a reference code. The reference code usually is just for a very, for very old architecture where jitting doesn't bring specific, specific performance improvement, we'll just do the reference code. But most of the time, we'll just use jitted code. So for the convolutions, we have two algorithms. We have the direct convolution and Vinograd convolution. So most of the framework do not use the Vinograd implementation, but currently we're working on automatic dispatching. So, so far the design choice was to let the user choose because using a direct convolution and the Vinograd convolution will change the accuracy of your model. And we didn't want that to happen, so we wanted to let the user be free to choose. But people are just using a direct convolution, so we'll, we'll add the automatic dispatching and see if they complain. <laughs> but but that, that, that's most of it. And for RNNs, so currently the RNN is just calling the S, so we call it GTIT SGEM, so we have a SGEM that is GTIT inside MKLDNN, so we call that SGEM. So most of the, most of the operations actually are GTIT for AVX2 and plus. Yes? Actually, you're asking questions about my bonus slides. <laughs> so, so if you want to profile uh, your application, so, so exactly. So if you're working on an application, generally you don't need to care about MKLDNN. The only way you will see it is through profiling. So, uh, generally you have recommendations that come with the framework. So we we tell people usually to follow those recommendations versus the recommendation that we give for MKLDNN, because there are other functions than just the MKLDNN function in the framework. So those recommendations will apply to everything and not just the MKLDNN part. So follow those recommendations usually is a good idea. And the second thing is that if you're in your application, you have bad performance, what you have to do is to profile it. So you have several ways to do that. The first way is to run the profiler from your, from your, from your framework. So if you use TensorFlow, for example, just use the timeline, run the timeline and see what, what's going on in the timeline. That should give you a good idea first. The second part is to use Vtune. So most of the framework will support VTune, and MKLDN supports VTune too. The only thing with MKLDN is that you have to build it specifically to, to because of the GTIT kernels, so you have to add these, these options, so the VTune root. So, but that's the only thing. So, and then you will have MKLDN primitive, and you will know if the GTIT kernel is taking a long time, you will know where it dispatched, you will, you will get this information. The other way you can do is to use the MKLDN verbose. So it's very similar to MKL verbose. Before running your workload, you will do MKL verbose equal one, MKLDN verbose equal one or two, and you will run it. And you will get some output that has this format. So here, that's very interesting to have that output because it will give you a lot of hints of how much reorder is happening and how, how big is that overhead. It will also tell you which kind of uh, code was being dispatched. So if you see that it's going to the reference path when there is a GT dev path available, that means there is a dispatching issue in MKLDNN, for example. And it will also give you the time for each of those primitives spent in, MK spend in MKLDNN. So here it's very useful because you can see the framework overhead around your primitives. So if you have a convolution, for example, that takes five milliseconds in MKLDNN, but 15 in your framework, that means that there is a lot going on in the framework before that convolution. Uh, yes, and that, that's what I mentioned earlier, but then you have like, you can have like three kind of gaps when you profile your application. So either functional gaps, so you will see that you have a primitive that is not supported in MKLDNN and that has a poor implementation in the framework. So then either you have to work on the implementation in the framework or you can ask us to support that. Then it can be, it can be an integration gap. So if you see, for example, in the trace that you have reorders around every single primitive of MKLDNN, that's usually a, a good sign that layer propagation is not happening. And also you have like regular performance issue in the library. <laughs>
But yes, that, that's what, if you're an application developer, that's most of the time what, what, how you will be confronted to MKLDNN. So just you profile, you see what is happening, and depending on that, you use. So, so uh, there is a hands-on material that will be available on the website soon, and that, that, that is actually a walkthrough on exactly that process. So you take a topology, the integration has an issue, then the idea is to showcase, or like to have like a, a walkthrough on an example on, okay, how to detect the issues and how to go fix it. So if you're interested in that, you can you can go through that hands-on material and and see that, or we can talk together and and we can look at that. <laughs>